Hey, thanks for joining us tonight for Wednesday night Bible study. I'll give it a few minutes, let a couple other people have some time to join in. We'll get started. All right, we'll start off with... Uh, a prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your love, your compassion. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Father, I pray that you would allow this message to touch hearts and minds, God. And I just pray, Lord, that this word can bring some clarity to, to your people and that um, they're, they're able to grow from it. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So um, tonight I wanted to talk about faithfulness, um, but mainly it's, a, it's going to be a, you know, a, a topic that concerns both blood and bondage. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, throughout history, starting at the very beginning, um, we, we have always had a problem with staying on the right track. Uh, along our walk with God and along our walk, in life in general, we have found it difficult to stay focused and, and stay on the right track. One, one of the scriptures that I want to point out early in this message is um, from Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So th this is important. Um, to get out of the way at the very beginning because <clears throat> we'll see throughout this study, you know, how important the blood actually is. So for all of time, Israel spent going in and out of bondage. Um, we, we see this, this consistency in a parallel path, and that consistency is the development of the bloodline leading to Jesus Christ always continued. Now, there were times when, when the Lord would have to send deliverers to bring Israel out of bondage um, when they found themselves tied up again. But, you know, ultimately, even, even throughout that course um, of their ups and downs, God never abandoned his original mission, which was to bring about the, 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 final, the final atonement for the sins of man. So, Israel's problem was that they would experience deliverance and then they would find themselves back under the rule of a slave master. And this happened over and over again throughout the course of their journey and their, their walk with God being his called people. So um, I, I feel like it's worth noting that what, what caused them to stray was never um, a, physical, a physical pull out of the hand of the Lord. And the reason I say that is because in John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father am one, are one. So it, it's interesting that that Jesus points this out and specifically states that, that nobody's able to pluck his people out of his hand. Um, he, he specifically says, you know, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And in turn, 
I and my father are one. No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. And, you know, that, that's actually a physical action to pluck, right? So <clears throat> it's, it's not possible for somebody to physically take you out of God's hand. It's, it's not possible. Um, what actually happens is that throughout a series of choices that you make, you are actually led away. So, you know, while nobody can come up and grab you, if you find yourself getting too distracted with the wrong things, then it's easily for you to find yourself, you know, out of God's will, out of his hand. So our questions here are, are these. So if, if Jesus solved the problem, then, you know, why are we still so troubled. And my answer to that is that we still have a certain level of responsibility with regard to our salvation. Now, Jesus did the heavy lifting. Now, it, it's up to us, you know, to, to remain and to be able to hold on to that gift that he gave us. So, I think one of the things that, that we need to consider um, to help us take it a little more seriously is what did it actually take for the blood of the lamb to get here? Now, you could go through all of the scriptures that talk about lineage if you want. I decided to go with a summary of it out of Matthew chapter 1, and it's verse 17. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So from the time that the promise was given to Abraham, it has taken 42 generations for, for the blood to come to fruition. Now, prior to that, we know that this was in God's plan from the very beginning. So it took longer than 42 generations, but... From the time that the promise was shared with man, it had taken 42 generations for this blood to get here. And that's a lot of work. We might not be able to fully grasp that because we're bound by time, but we serve a God that's not bound by time. What he did over the, that course of 42 generations was absolutely remarkable. Like any time we found ourselves... Um, in a bad situation, sometimes a worse situation than the bad situation that we had before, he would take time to provide for us a deliverance as a stopgap measure until the blood was here. So I think it's interesting, too, that um, when, you, when you look at this, this story, like Matthew starts with Abraham. He's, he says it starts from there. And I'm imagining that that's because that's where the promise was given. Um, and, I, and I think when it comes to Abraham, a question I, I often have is like, what did Abraham do so differently? And, you know, in, in reading Paul's letter to Timothy, I would like to use his words. And and say that Abraham fought a good fight, he finished his course, and he kept the faith. So you got to understand that throughout Abraham's life, there always had to be some intervention from the enemy along the way trying to get Abraham to stray from the path that he had set out on and what he was, what he was called to. Um, but Abraham was able to stay focused, and I believe the motive behind that had to have been a, a high level of discipline. So we think about the, the big things that happened in Abraham's life, and so, so like when Abraham would encounter God, he would, he would raise up an altar um, at that moment, you know, and, and it never got to a point where Abraham would say, oh, well, this is, the, this is the third time God talked to me. I don't feel like I need to, to raise up a, you know, an altar this time. He, yeah, he'll talk to me again. Or, you know, when, when Abraham split from Lot, his nephew, and, and Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah, but Abraham pitched his tent away from wickedness and ultimately towards righteousness, 
that, that also tells us a, a story. And then when the, Lord told, <clears throat> when the Lord told Abraham to take a son up on the mountain to sacrifice him, Abraham went. So for Abraham's environment, I would say that all of these things that happen and Abraham's responses are all the result of these disciplines of a godly man. And, and all of them are in direct contradiction to the voice of the enemy that had to be there almost every step of the way. You know, every time you try to do the right thing, you try to do um, what, what is necessary according to scripture, there's always something that's trying to deter you from seeing the end of it, right? And I feel like in Abraham's life, he had to have encountered that. But Abraham had developed such a discipline that he remained almost immovable until, you know, it was his time. So we know that, that there have been constant failures of man. Um, and in those failures, we would call out to God. And in calling out to God, he would, he would hear our cries and he would send to us some sort of deliverance. All the while, still working on the development of the blood of the lamb, which would come and alleviate us from, you know, the payment for the sins that we have committed, which is amazing to me. And, and I, I feel like this is the epitome of discipline and faithfulness. And this is the... These are the traits that we have to learn from God. These are the traits that we have seen lived out in, in Abraham, you know. So when we hear Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, and it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, we, we, have, to, we have to capture the full weight of that statement, um, I mean, 42 generations is an incredibly long time. And for, for God to remain focused on the restoration of his relationship with man for that amount of time, it means a lot. And, and we, should, we should take it as it means a lot. Um, to me, that's the definition of no shadow of turning. At, at any point in time, he could have threw his hands up, you know, hey, th you know, that. I've been working on this for so long, they, they can't stay focused for any measure of time. Uh, you know, why, why even bother? But he continued, he continued to work on the ultimate answer that would be our deliverance. Now, back, back to my point, if, if Jesus did all of this work, why do we still find ourselves so troubled? It's because we don't receive, we don't receive his gift with the full weight. And I believe we have difficulty still with the discipline part. So, so we do have a level of responsibility when it comes to our own salvation. And the discipline is what I want to, what I want to focus on tonight. So th think about it. If every time you start something, you get a little bit of discouragement and you stop that path and then start another one, you know, you're, you're not consistent. You're not seeing anything through. So how in the world are you expected to finish this race <clears throat> that we have to run? And I, I feel like the quickest way to fail at anything is to just stop, right? So if you allow yourself to become so distracted that you just stop on the path that you started on and you don't allow God to finish the work that he began in you, then, you, you know, you're guaranteed to fail. There's no way you can win. Um, what we learn from all of this at, up to this point is that we need to be consistent in following Christ. Anytime people find themselves returned to spiritual bondage, I can almost guarantee you it's the result of, um, you know, that, that lack of judgment that, that leads to a lapse in your discipline and ultimately gives the devil a foot in to where he's able to set up camp. So when you look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
verses 24 through 27. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body, I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Now, I want to pick this apart a little bit and spend some time here. So, when we look at verse 24, he specifically says he enters the race to run it and to win. So, what's, what's not acceptable when you enter a race to run it and with the intention to win, walking fast is, is unacceptable, jogging, lagging behind, showing little concern for the finish. So, I would say that some of these point to an attitude of complacency. So maybe you've, you've been able to stay disciplined for a certain period of time, but then at a certain point, you find yourself a little distracted, and then you kind of you know, start to let go of some of those disciplines that you held on to early on. And it's critical to stay in shape for this race. Right. The, the next thing <clears throat> he talks about is is the strict discipline and training that comes along with it, being able to control yourself. And, and that's out of verse 25, where it says every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, temperate in all things, when it, when an athlete trains, they typically try to focus on on the whole the whole um, human of their self. They focus on the body, the mind, and the spirit. Um, they'll find time to get away, uh, you know, clear their mind, refresh themselves. They, they also try to, you know, make sure that even in, in training their body, they give their body periods of rest, but they know that when they're in the race, that's not the time to take a period of rest. So, in the same way, spiritually, in order to, to maintain and to be able to run this race, we have to make sure that we're temperate in all things, right? We have to control, you know, our mind, our thoughts. That, that's a huge one. Being able to control your mind and your thoughts is a huge one. A lot of the things that, that you get into, the majority of the battle is going to be a mental one. Um, so we have to make sure that, that we're able to stay on top of that. We have to make sure we're doing what's necessary to maintain a healthy spirit. So that includes disciplines such as you, you know, reading the Word, staying in it, um, spending time with God, being in His presence. Your spirit needs those things to be able to be healthy um, in order to give you the strength to be able to finish this race. You also have to make sure that you're working out consistently in both ministry and service to others. So, you know, doing all of the practice means nothing if it's never put into application, right? So why would somebody train for a race for, let's say, their entire lives, but then never get into the race? Um, it's wasted talent. It's wasted time. It's wasted training, you know, and, and the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that <clears throat> we are training to run a race to an end, right? There's something that, that's promised to us after, and that's that eternal life, being in the presence of our Lord and Savior for, for eternity. Um, the other thing to think about is how an athlete would train and then they go to run their race and they do it with full focus. They, they're able to, to channel in, focus in on this one objective and put away all other distractions. So when, when, you, see, when you see children run a race, right, sometimes 
they may go the wrong way. They may cross over outside of the lines for the lane that they're in. You see all, all kind of things. Um, they'll, they'll stop, run to the side, you know, start, start conversing with family. Meanwhile, this whole race is going on and it's, it's funny. Sometimes it's even cute when a child is doing it. But if, if you were training for the Olympics and it's time for you to run your race and you know, you start off the starting block and next thing you know, you decide, hey, I want to turn around and run the other way. It's not so cute anymore. It's not funny anymore. Um, when you get so distracted that you just stop in the middle of the race and, and go off to the side, there, there is no prize, no treasure for that person who cannot stay focused for, for any period of time. Um, the other thing is being able to, to master your body, not giving in to all of those desires of the flesh. We, we know that in scripture it tells us that the flesh is opposed to God. This is an, an inherent nature of the flesh. Anything of the flesh is opposite of the spirit. And, you know, a, a child, again, a child training for a race may find themselves often, um, you know, pounding down sugar still, eating what, whatever comes up, you know, all, all sorts of things that they, they put in, into their body, you know, just satisfying that, that desire of the flesh. But as an adult, when you mature and you're preparing for something, right, you, at that point, you should know better. You should know that those things are not okay. And there's a certain way that you need to train in order to be able to even finish the race that you're preparing yourself for. So you can't always just give in to whatever it is that the flesh desires. Um, the other thing too is you, you guard yourself against disqualification when you're in this race. So where, where a child may not know that you can't just stop and run backwards, at, at a certain point in maturity, they learn that and they know that. They know that they should not be going backwards. That's something that, <clears throat> that we should get as we mature in this thing and then we should never let go of that. We should never let go of the fact that we should not be going backwards. And this was a, a, a big problem with Israel's journey. They would get so far, um, they would get comfortable, they would get complacent with God and then they would then start to go backwards and they will find themselves again yet in, in bondage. And that's the same way for, for us Christians today. We get complacent with God's presence. We get, we get complacent with God's blessings. And then we slowly can begin to slip and go back the other way. Um, uh, and and that, that is a quick way to get yourself disqualified. I mean, listen to, to how Paul put it. He said, you know, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. He understood that just because he preached the folks, it was no guarantee that, you know, he had an end. He knew that there were still things that, that he had to abide by. There were still, there were still things that he, he could not go backwards and do if he was to ever finish this race. Now, I would say here also that when we, when we talk about building up these disciplines and staying in them, maintaining that discipline, um, you know, we can't in, in any means have a lapse in judgment and allow the devil to even have a crack. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians to put on the full armor of God. That means don't leave any piece of it behind. Don't leave anything to chance. Don't say, well, hey, I don't think I'll need that part today, or I don't think I, I need this, this piece of it today. You need all of it. You need all of it. You need to be committed to this. Like you, you, have, to, you have to get a hold of the fact that we're talking about spiritual life and death here. And, it, and just like in a marathon, it may seem like the finish is so far away, but the finish is still there. No matter how far away it may seem today, it may seem closer tomorrow, it may seem further tomorrow, but the finish is still there. That's one thing that you can most definitely
count on. And, and once you have received this precious gift of the blood of Christ, that after the promise was 42 generations in the making, something that, that's that precious to you, you should guard it with everything that you have at your disposal. Like, why, why would you get something that precious and then leave a window open on the temple or leave the door unlocked? so that a thief can come in and steal away, you know, what was given to you. That, that seems um, ir irresponsible to me. It seems irrational. Something is that precious. And, and I think maybe sometimes we get complacent and we lose sight of how precious that gift actually is. So the other thing I would say to, to guard yourself against is, like, you don't want your disciplines to lead you down the path into another form of legalism. Because I, like a byproduct of that legalism is you beginning to think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Um, you start to look, look down on other people um, in their condition, you know, while they're having trouble trying to stay focused on the race as well. And that's another, that's another thing that you don't wanna, it's a spiritual trap that you don't wanna fall into. Um, and I, I, I really, I really feel like, you know, it, it's a bit of a slippery slope because again, and, and this may be honestly driven by, um, some, some ego issues, right? I feel like you start to deny yourself certain things because you're trying to stay focused on this race. And then you may see somebody struggling and, and immediately you, you begin to, to puff yourself up, feeling like, oh, well, I'm better than that person because look at all of the, the things that, that I've denied myself. But in, in all of this, <clears throat> as we look at how God managed this over time, one of the things that helped him to continue on is the compassion and the love that God has for mankind. And because of that, each step of the way when, when man had fallen, um, fallen away, turned away, began to worship idols, uh, there would be a remnant of people who would understand the fallen state that they were in. They would cry out to God and God would have mercy and compassion. And, and you know, along with God's faithfulness, we find this mercy and compassion that's also trailing throughout the Bible as the bloodline is being developed. So when you, when you learn, when you mature and you learn to discipline yourself um, and, and your walk with God, always remember, too, that you have to have compassion and mercy for others. Just as you have received compassion and mercy and the grace of God, you also have to provide that to others. Um, now, I hope that this message has blessed someone tonight. I hope that this has brought some, some clarity or maybe even stirred a renewed desire to get back into, you know, the, the whole discipline of this thing and, and being focused. Maybe, maybe it's able to help you to refocus, pull everything into perspective. I know for me, when I look at that and I look at, you know, the length of 42 generations, like that's huge to me. You know how much happened in that period of time and not once did God decide, hey, you know, it's not worth it. The whole time he felt like it was worth it. He felt like you were worth it. He felt like I was worth it. And I think that that's something that's so precious and, and important to us that we should do everything that we can to guard it. So again, I thank you for, for joining tonight and um, I, I pray that the Lord will bless you.